Hello friends, it's Bob Tarter again with Animology and our Animology Unleashed Imagine Your Story. Our friend L, the Eurasian Eagle Owl. So that's what's cool about our friend here. This is the same genus as our Great Horned Owl, but this is a different species. This is one that is found living over in England and lives east all the way through Asia to the Pacific Ocean, up into Siberia, all the way down to Middle East and India. There's actually 17 different subspecies of the Eurasian eagle owl. And for those of you that are Harry Potter fans, most of the owls used in the movies were these. Now there's 17 different subspecies, so they have different colorations and size, but that's the key. Now to be able to identify the difference between our Eurasian and our great horned owl is when you look at the eye, the colored part of the eye, this is a little bit more orange yellow than just straight yellow of our great horned owl. Now this is a big predator, and people think I'm a lot stronger than what I really am. But you have to understand, people estimate her weight to be 25, 35 pounds. I'm not that strong. This is a very big flying bird at five and a half pounds. I'm not even touching skin yet. The birds are nothing but feathers. But for a five pound animal, does she have large eyeballs? Yes, they're bigger than mine. And I weigh over 200 pounds now. Thank you, quarantine. And what we have right here is this animal has these huge eyes to give her that great sense of vision. But I've actually seen owls survive in the wild with only one functioning eye because owls actually find their food by their sense of hearing. But when we look at those eyes, try this experiment. Hold your head still, look up to the ceiling, down to the floor, left and right. You can move your eyes up, down, left and right because we have six muscles to do so. When you look at L, her eyes will never move. There's no muscles to move those eyes because if you had owl-sized eyeballs in your head, you would have dodgeballs for eyeballs. And if you had dodgeball size eyeballs in your head, you'd look funnier. Now, what we have to think about with this animal here is she has great nocturnal vision, but her best sense is her sense of hearing. Now these feathers here, those are just that, feathers. Her ears are that little crescent shape you can see right there. Now every other feather on our girl here is flat, using that mimicry to blend in. Where the feathers that make up this crescent shape, you can see look like frost or a snowflake. They're three-dimensional. They can be articulated. That's her ears. She has one ear hole high and one ear hole low by that flesh-tearing beak. That's why if you sometimes watch an owl, they do this weird little head bob dance. Their ears are tuning and listening to a spot. I've got these big honking ears on the side of my head. I'm hearing my voice, the echo in the room, the squawking, talking bird, some of the animals behind me. L is not. L only hears where she's looking. And she'll sit very still in the darkness of night, listening for food. Her hearing is so good, she can hear a mouse breathe at 150 yards. No. And what happens is she waits for that prey to make a mistake and leave cover. And as soon as it does, she'll fly under full power all the way through the night sky, grab a hold of the prey with these huge talons here, and the prey never knows what hit him because the owl's wings make no noise. You can feel lots of wind moving, but there is no sound. The owl is the ninja of the animal world. Now you've been watching her. Her eyes don't move, but does she have a flexible neck? Yeah. Can an owl spin her head all the way around? No, it'll pop off. You don't believe me? Try it on a chicken. Chicken dumplings. What you have to understand here is mammals, we have seven vertebrae in our neck. Think of that. We have the same vertebrae in our neck that a giraffe does, as well as a blue whale. And we have a good range of motion. She has more vertebrae. They have 14. And having flexible muscles are not going to add any more weight to her. So what she's going to be able to do is she can rotate her head 210 degrees. She cannot spin it all the way around. And that's going to help her because, remember, she can't move her eyes. But then she can move these satellite dish ears for us. When the last sense notice on her, look at that nose. Does she have a good sense of smell? Nope. And with that, one of our owl's favorite things to eat, skunks. Because if you can't smell them, a skunk's actually a very common black and white animal that nobody else eats at nighttime. Now, L here is also used as an abatement bird. She is a good educate in ambassador, but she is used as abatement. Think of an orchard or a vineyard or a landfill. And what we'll do is if you can have noxious birds coming in, you got gulls taking trash from a landfill, you got birds eating the farmer's crops off, you can spray chemicals or put up noisemakers, 
or you have a falconer come and we bring our bird of prey and we fly them around, we chase away the prey species just by the presence of the predator alone. And if I work for a winery, we barter services. <laughs> now, with this animal here, excellent vision, but her best sense is that hearing. Strong, powerful feet. We're gonna show you some of our training videos of Elle here. Elle has to earn her food. Parents, with your children, you can use negative enforcement. It is actually a very good tool to use on them. That doesn't work with something like this. These feet here can do 500 pounds of pressure per square inch. So if I do something negative, she could break every bone in my hand. So I do not use negative. She only uses positive. We fly her from perch to perch on command, and that's how she gets her piece of food for us. Hello friends, this is Bob Tarter with Animology again. We have our next more charismatic one for us. I want you all to meet Tracy. Say hi, Tracy. Now Tracy here is a very interesting North American rodent. What we're looking at here is the black-tailed prairie dog. Now she doesn't look like much, but this is basically a squirrel that lives in a world where there's not any trees. And that's what is special about our little prairie dog here. But the prairie dog is one of the greatest lessons I can teach you. And that is the keystone species. When you see an archway, the center stone in the top is called the keystone. It holds the whole thing together. And that's why we call these the keystone species. Now my hedgehogs love to get their massages or the prey dogs love to get their massages during the program. And she actually does upside down dog yoga poses. Really wish I was that flexible. That would be nice. I have a bad back. But what we have to think about here is prey dogs are found living in a large group called a prairie dog town. And in that prairie dog town, it's a massive network of tunnels, cavities underneath the soil. We're on top of the ground. They're just like you people that live in town. They mow the grass. They manipulate the vegetation. Because when you're this big, there's lots of things that are going to eat you. But if you can keep the grass short and tender, you can see farther. Now, prairie dogs are going to be, again, a sociable animal. They live in that group. But look at those eyes. The ears are small because they spend so much time underneath. And those whiskers and that sense of smell. Those are those senses. Definitely are herbivore, eating only plant material for us. And prairie dogs were very common. They were found as far east as Arkansas, all the way west to California, all the way up into Canada, all the way down into Mexico. The problem is these animals have now been removed to only 4% of their natural historic range because of us, because of mankind. When we tried to domesticate the American West and we brought our livestock out there, they go running through a prairie dog town. You go running through a prairie dog town, you're going to fall in a hole and break your leg. So these animals have been shot, trapped, poisoned, removed to only 4%. And that's sad because as a keystone species, they help everybody out. Herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. Now, the first time I found a prairie dog, I was hiking through the desert badlands of North Dakota. I came up out of a drainage on the flat part of the land. I've been hiking for like four hours already and I've only seen like two lizards. And I came up onto it and it looked like a golf course to the horizon. Short, tender green grass with holes and these rodents running around. And it was full of life. There was prairie dogs, jackrabbits, antelope, deer, all the way up to 3,000 pound bison. And all of these herbivores are hanging around because the prairie dogs keep the grass short and tender, which is more attractive. It tastes better, more nutritious. So then more herbivores show up. This allows the prairie dog towns to expand. Now these animals are not only feeding these other herbivores, they benefit from it. When you're this big, you're worried about a lot of predators. But if your best friend is a six and a half foot tall, 3,000 pound bison bull, you're not really worried about anything anymore. But prey dogs will even have vocalizations. They have certain alarm calls. If a predator, a raptor is flying overhead, or if a coyote is slinking through. So they take care of each other. And that's where these animals, as the keystone species, even help us. In the desert, when it rains, it may not rain very often, but whenever it rains, it tends to rain a lot very quickly. And without the soil and the vegetation we have here, the water runs, it erodes. It takes what soil is away. So when we have a prairie dog town and it rains, all the water runs right into the tunnels. That's fine. These animals build their towns to handle. The water then will slowly absorb into the groundwater. A prey dog town in Montana collects the well water so somebody in Arizona can get their well water from the aquifer. That's why we call these the keystone species. They help us out. One prey dog isn't going to be able to survive though. And that's where we need to take a lesson from the prey dog. Living together in our community. 
During these trying times, we need to take care of each other. Keep your eyes up. Help them out. One prey dog wouldn't be able to survive, but living in that prey dog town, these animals even manipulate the weather. Prey dogs spend all day long running below the surface to the top, and they take the cool, moist air from below the surface of the soil to the top, exhaling, which seeds rain clouds. Sometimes our rainfall here in Tennessee started with a bunch of prairie dog breath in Oklahoma. Uh, 